Okay, so Sensei, thank you very much for, for that interview. Uh, so many years we talking about so many interesting things and finally I just wanted to record this. And also I believe that is so many students that you have over, all over the world. They will be interesting to know a little bit more about your training, about how did you start, how was to train before and so many things. Mm. Thank you, Michael. Um, I began training when I was 18 years old. A friend of mine called Jack Gregory had been practicing uh, probably about a year and it took him about nine months for him to persuade me to come along to his dojo. So I really went along not being particularly interested because he asked me to go. But when I got there, I was really intrigued. And there was a man there called Fred Wainwright and he had been a student of O-Sensei as uh, Fred Wainwright was part of the occupying forces uh, that were in Japan just after the war. So Fred Wainwright was, as I've said, a student of Osensei and became Shodan before he left Japan and came to England. And he told me that Osensei said to him, please go to England and help teach and spread Aikido. And after that, we practiced under the auspices of Naro Sensei, who used to come over from France very often to give us weekend courses. And I remember that um, when I took my very first grading uh, under Naro Sensei, I did something that looked like a forward breakfall and something that looked like Shihonagi, but he gave me 6Q. I think actually looking back, it was terrible. <laughs> but after that, um, Chiba Sensei came and we started to follow Chiba Sensei. And I owe a great debt to Chiba Sensei. He gave us spirit and a, a deep understanding of, of Aikido. After that, um, I was with Kanetsuka Sensei. And also I, had, uh, I was lucky enough to have close contact with Sekiya Sensei for, for about one year. Also when I was in Japan, I was looked after by Sekiya Sensei, who was a student of Yamaguchi Sensei. And to tell you the truth, that um, practicing with Chiba Sensei, although incredible and very, very special training, when I saw Yamaguchi Sensei's Aikido, I decided to change my approach to Aikido. And when I saw Yamaguchi Sensei, I saw what I thought was the philosophy of Aikido actually in the practice, which I hadn't considered before, which now seems very obvious, but at the time, uh, it was quite startling for me. So I trained with Kinetic Sensei for many years and gained much experience. And also Kinetic Sensei um, invited many other different prominent Aikido teachers to this country. And I was privileged to be able to practice with them also. So that's the latest. Okay, it was very, very briefly. I wanted to ask you some in between. Uh, who was that student of Fosin Sensei that came in England? Uh, Sekia Sensei. Sekia. He was actually Chiba Sensei's uh, father-in-law. Oh, okay. His Aikido yeah. is very effective, but very soft, very gentle, but at the same time very powerful. Was there a British Aikido Federation? Yes, like this? that was under the British Aikido Federation. Yeah. And where, where, when did you, where did you train? In Liverpool or in London? Or where was I was training mostly um, in this area, on the Wirral, the Wirral Peninsula. But I always travelled to wherever Chiba Sensei was giving courses and wherever Sekiya Sensei was giving courses. Um, Sekiya Sensei stayed at my house a few times. Also, I stayed at his house in Japan. And I was privileged also to go to places like Southern Ireland with Sekiya Sensei when he gave a course there. Okay. You said about how, how Yamaguchi uh, actually changed your uh, help you to change your perspective of Aikido, but how did you continue after this? Okay, I had to find a new way of practicing and the answer had to come in one way from myself and I had to change myself. So I saw myself as, of course, full of energy and vitality, but I saw myself also perhaps trying to dominate other people and Aikido, that the Aikido that Yamaguchi Sensei showed seemed to be very relaxed. 
and I wasn't. And so I set about teaching myself deep, profound relaxation. And by doing so, I felt that I perhaps gained a sensitivity that I didn't have before. And also changing my outlook and really by understanding myself more and more, trying to understand other people. And I think this is a very important point. So rather than seeing an attacker as a kind of enemy that had to be destroyed or put down, I tried to view the attacker as someone who was my friend. Osensi said that Aikido is based on love, and nobody really wants to, to hear that, I suppose, because it sounds a bit corny, which is an English expression. Um, it sounds a bit wet. But in fact, if you're experiencing love and compassion towards someone, you cannot be afraid at the same time. So fear yes. and love do not go together. Yes. So exactly. by approaching someone who's trying to attack you, not from a fearful, fearful perspective or a perspective of trying to gain an advantage to hurt somebody, so trying to have a perspective that's based on love in that way, you can then create a kind of gravity field, a loving gravity field towards the person who is attacking you you can make a centrifugal connection or gravitational connection with the person who is attacking you and the whole thing is changed from one of force to one of harmony. Also by doing this you can develop um, your own, what's the word I'm looking for, um, gyroscopic stability. So Osensei said that he, Osensei, was at one with the universe and that's quite a wild claim if you think about it. And if it's true, which I believe it was, there has to be a mechanism. For everything, even strange things, there has to be a mechanism. So, one of the forces that sustains our life and the uh, life of the Earth is gravity. It also holds the universe together. Gravity, electromagnetic radiation, um, centrifugal force and so by embodying these forces in yourself and developing these forces and gravitating towards your attacker with these forces then it can make such a great difference so you are no longer reliant on physical strength which can be very limited to gravitational and centrifugal forces which are really quite limitless so this is the direction of, of my personal practice and my personal development. And it's part of the system that I'm trying to teach my students. Um, I remember I remember first time when I met you. In, actually, I was nearly ready to quit Aikido and probably I would if I haven't seen you. By this time, I already had a feeling that something is missing in the standard training that I had, uh, especially from self-defense perspective, what I was mostly looking for back then. But then I saw how easy you overcome any kind of resistance of okay with no pressure from your side, no matter how strong they were holding you, even against the direction of the form that you showed. I haven't seen anybody else to be able to do this. Normally the Aikido teachers, they they expect you, they require full cooperation in order to execute their techniques. So you never know, are they really able to make it otherwise? Uh, also, I remember something you said, which was a really turning point for me. You said that every time you're fighting somebody, you fight actually with part of yourself and you projecting that part and the partner become like a mirror of yourself. By understanding myself more and more, I began to realize that um, people generally are acting out of some kind of insane dysfunction. And I think this is throughout the world. Throughout the world, people have never stopped killing each other. The history of the world has gone on for thousands and thousands of years and still even now we're killing each other and this is 
its insane dysfunction. And if through Aikido we can learn to see ourselves clearly, then we can put an end to this dysfunction and slowly but surely um, work towards peace within ourselves and peace within society and peace within the different countries. It was O Sensei's desire to, for the world to come together through Aikido to attain peace. But there has to be the correct process. So self-observation, um, real deep honest self-observation is totally important. Nobody likes to be told that they're doing something wrong, for instance. But if you're prepared to look at yourself clearly and deeply, then, as you say, you can look at other people and see them as mirrors of yourself if you're trying to dominate them and trying to uh, just use your strength and will over them instead of coming together in harmony and compassion. So I believe that a real true practice of Aikido should include self-abandonment, self-abandonment, surrender to the workings of the universe. Actually something strange that I, I've seen is in, in Aikido you can see more like, uh, like uh, people compete more than the other martial arts, I mean compete mentally, mm -hmm. compete like uh, characters, not real physical competition. Because in one Jiu-Jitsu dojo, for example, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, they, they do submission all the time and they know who is stronger, so they mm. accept that and they have a nature of respect. But because in Aikido they can't they can meet physically, there is a something like a big resistance. Uh, I've seen that many, many times between organizations, between people, between dojos, because uh, yeah, everybody speak about peace and harmony, but they keep the big ego, and that ego is protected under this higher philosophy. Yes, you're right. And, and that's why this total abundance that you said, it should happen in personal level. Everyone should yes. look himself what he is and start to change from inside. Absolutely. The change has to start from yourself. Yes. Uh, that's why Austin says said that uh, it's, it's not the way to change other people but to change yourself. Exactly. Okay, Sensei, uh, can you say something about this that you mentioned in the morning class, about what role is the consciousness in, in your Aikido practice? Obviously, it's not just a technique when you just apply to somebody. It's something beyond that. Yes, although it takes time and deep study. In one sense, you have to merge with the attacker's consciousness. Okay? You can only do, you can't do this if you're afraid of your partner. You can't do this if you want to dominate your partner. But you should project your consciousness towards the attacker. There should be a joining of minds, a connection with your partner's spirit, so that you can learn to lead your, your partner's spirit in a direction which is harmonious and was within the normal, uh, practice of Aikido, quite simply. And I talk a lot about creating a gravitational connection, a gravity field towards your partner. And within that gravity field, there is consciousness. And this can be learned, this can be practiced. And once you take your partner into your field of consciousness and you feel your partner's intention, then your technique can take on another dimension. I guess that for the people who never met you in person, all this information might sound strange, abstract, and they could easily reject it. But for all of us who had a chance to practice with you, we know what special experiences. Actually, you are popular not only with your subtle teaching of, on many levels and the unique technique, of course, but also with your incredible strength. You are the only teacher I know who invite us to test the technique anytime with full resistance and somehow we are totally unable to block it, although the full power and pressure that we use.
Many years ago, Chiba Sensei introduced Hogan Oshisan, who was the abbot of Shogenji Temple in Japan. And when I was in Japan in 1983-84, I visited Hogan Oshisan in his temple. But I stayed in touch with Oshisan, and especially he came to England, and I spent quite a lot of time with him. And he gave me a lot of instruction along with a lot of other people in Zazen and Zen meditation and Zen philosophy. He stayed at my house. I was privileged to have him as a guest. And also I was very privileged to be able to stay at Ryo Takaji in Japan with him. So in my own personal practice, when I was younger especially, I used to practice Zazen outside in the snow. Really? Yes, when it was really cold. So how important is Zazen for Aikido? Well, I can't say for everybody, but for me, Aikido is very, very important. And also, Zazen is important, and somehow they go together. I heard someone say that a Zen monk watched a demonstration of O Sensei and commented, ah, oh, moving Zen. So for me, trying to find that emptiness and state of being that is the same as Zen meditation in my Aikido practice. It's not easy, of course, but mm. um, I try to go in that direction. It's, it's interesting because according to the book, O Sensei, he didn't do Zen. He, he done mm, Misogi and this Qigong, yes. Kushin and the other practices, but he didn't do exactly that typical Zazen. I think uh, <coughs> O Sensei was a very special person rather like some kind of enlightened saint and quite simply he'd already surpassed the basic zazen practice i think yes, and was, exactly. had already reached a state of enlightenment yes yes exactly he surpassed yes so what was your how was your training when you was young at most active age my training when i was very young was extremely physical um, Sometimes it felt like we were trying to kill each other. <laughs> um, we used to do like hundreds of press-ups on the backs of our hands and, and lots of crazy things like that. Yes. Oh, somebody from your dojo told me that nobody wanted to practice with you. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I would, practice would begin, I'd bow to someone, I did, they'd bow and the bow would suddenly turn somewhere else and I'd left by myself. Yes. For me, for me now it's the same, but after the clapping, everybody disappears. But I guess it's not for the same reasons. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so you, you told me before that you, you didn't have a dojo and uh, you used some, your friend, karate instructor dojo. That's right, yes. There is a very nice martial arts called Goyaru. And a friend of mine had his own full-time dojo and still has. And again, I was very privilege to be able to use that every morning. So at some time in my professional life, I decided to give up everything and just to train and teach in Aikido. And for many years, I just practiced by myself, maybe four or five hours a day uh, by myself in his dojo. And that was a really good help to me and I'll always be very grateful to him for allowing me to use his very special place. And uh, you mentioned that you did Suburi like uh, two, three thousand, or what, what was it? Yes, it was. <coughs> Chiba Sensei started this. He would, as a special purification on Misogi, he would on occasion have us do uh, three thousand Shomenuchi with a Bokken. And I tried to carry on this tradition for many, many years, especially on the anniversary of the death of O Sensei, where we'd make a really special event and all the students would come together and we'd all do uh, 3,000 shomenuchi. And I remember particularly one year I asked one lady to count who was sitting at the edge and she got mixed up and we ended up doing 5,000. I thought I died. <laughs> it was tough and everybody else was falling about but, but we did it. And uh, by this time the training with Chiba Sensei was very tough. Lots of the time, training with Chiba Sensei, he would somehow evoke a, 
kind of very strong energy in the dojo. And a lot of the time when people got injured, it wasn't directly through Chiba Sensei, but somehow uh, this kind of energy would become infectious and everybody would be, it would look like anyone was everyone was trying to kill each other. And I remember one particular time when someone was using a bokken and someone's, all his front teeth were knocked out and fell on the floor. Okay. And Chiba Sensei uh, picked up the teeth and went over to the guy and said, I think these are yours. <laughs> <laughs> what injuries did you have? Wait, injuries, uh, broken rib, dislocated jaw, dislocated shoulders, broken arm. You can, I don't know, still see the swelling here now. After all those years, dislocated shoulder, broken shoulder, um, sprained ankle. It was, was normal thing Just by normal, this time. Yes. There was no health and safety. <laughs> no health and safety executive. <laughs> but Chiba Sensei was really special, very, very, very special. One thing that sticks out in my mind was um, I took him scuba diving once off the coast of North Wales, a place called Anglesey. He'd never done scuba diving before, but took to it right away. And we were going along underwater, and my own foot suddenly got caught in some old fishing line and I couldn't escape so I drew my knife to cut the fishing line away from my leg and Chiba Sensei immediately underwater boom he behaved as if I'd lured him down to kill him with my knife I was so embarrassed and I had my knife Sensei no I showed him that I was cutting the rope and so it just shows how careful Chiba Sensei was even just scuba diving he wasn't taking any chances. Okay, but although this heavy training, you, your approaching in the training is not the same with him. I mean, uh, this type of heavy, aggressive way of training is this, is this what the way of Aikido training should be? At the time, I felt that Chiba Sensei was doing his very, very best for everybody. And I think that he saw us as being out of harmony in various ways. And I think that this was his way of quite simply bringing us back into harmony. And again, I'm very grateful for this. It's, it's as though in those days, there was part of our mind that was asleep. And yes, with this uh, sudden strong technique, suddenly he woke us up. Uh, one particular time he asked me to make shomenuchi, and as I approached him and raised my arm, he punched me right in the nose. I was too close, quite simply. And he broke my nose and there was blood everywhere. Okay. And uh, one drop of my blood went on his kikogi, and he said, look what you've done, and told me to get out of the dojo because I've one drop of my well, blood it was your fault and you it was my fault you shouldn't spew your blood yes. there but so. this is remind me that because exactly n not exactly but very similar happened with you and me uh many years ago maybe 15 years ago when i was coming here i was attacking the show and you hit me here in the Forehead. here and i fall down just for a second fall down and then and then you said that it's disrespectful if you attack your teacher not in proper way. Mm -hmm. But it is sometimes when you get hit, you learn far more than everything Absolutely. else. Yes. So I don't remember many things that you told me, but I remember that case. It just awake me far more than Absolutely. thousands yes. of things that... So one punch can uh, take the place of 10,000 words. Yes, yes exactly what, what happened. Mm -hmm. but Hopefully my blood wasn't on you. <laughs> uh, okay, but still you you met Yamaguchi, right? And then you changed your mind. I mean, not change, but you upgrade your vision, your perspective of Aikido. Yes. It seemed as though, um, looking back, it seems as though there was the beautiful philosophy of Osensei, the philosophy of Aikido on one side, 
and then the practice on the other side, and both, again looking back, seem to be separate. And what I saw was with Yamaguchi Sensei that it seemed that he was bringing the actual philosophy and the practice together. And somehow this touched me deeply yes. and changed my direction in Aikido. So basically you went from one end to other end because he is very soft and receptive, the perceptive the energy, Yamaguchi. Yes, but very effective. Yes. And so you, you, you practice with Liba in one way, in a very hard way, and then you just go to the other. But one thing Chiba Sensei said was, in order to understand softness, you have to understand hardness. So maybe yes. I was going through a process anyway. Yes. And uh, what's happened next? Yes, also, uh, Kinetika Sensei's Aikido changed around that same time, I, I feel. And I feel that uh, Kinetika Sensei's direction was the same as mine, and that's why I followed Kinetika Sensei for such a long time. Uh, one thing that um, I've thought of lately is that most people who are practicing teaching Aikido, they all have a photograph of O Sensei and bow to O Sensei at the beginning and end of class, quite rightly so. But I was thinking that O Sensei gave out what was, or what I see as a complete teaching which covered uh, quite a few things. And O Sensei's philosophy especially um, was very, very special and very, very akin to Christianity and most other good religions. And <clears throat> it seems as if these days people are only taking part of O Sensei's teaching, maybe just the techniques, where he, he said quite clearly that in our minds we should have no enemies. For instance, the same as uh, Christ said, for instance. And uh, many things. So I think that we should take a step back and look at the actual teachings of O Sensei and think about real harmony, not one person trying to dominate the other, not uh, people trying to control each other, but quite simply people practicing in real harmony with real concern about each other's um, safety, health and spiritual development. Where did you learn Kotodama? I first encountered Kotodama as the basic chanting that we did with Chiba Sensei um, when doing Zazen. But I became intrigued by this practice. It, it got to me somehow. It, uh, it reached into my soul, actually. <laughs> and I researched this and started practicing myself from various different sources. I had information and I formulated uh, my own system, which seemed uh, in one sense to be very traditional. And I got a lot, I got a lot out of chanting Kotodama. It's as if chanting Kotodama is a natural expression of my, uh, of my gratitude for being alive and also um, saying by name the different forces that sustain our lives and having gratitude to those forces and evoking those forces within oneself. So, um, but my practice of Kotodama perhaps is very personal in one level, but a lot of people these days like to practice with me and I'm very grateful for that. Okay, uh, but this system that you're doing now, did you did the same with Chiba Sensei or somebody else? No. You this. My practice also includes uh, the evocation of Kundalini energy, which for me puts me in touch with myself and my connection with the universe and induces sometimes altered states of consciousness where you can access different energies that you would not normally come into contact with and also receive information. So. Partly my own practice of Kozadama comes from my own personal encounter uh, through altered states of consciousness where I have found myself quite spontaneously starting to chant things that I never ever heard of before. 
in one of the book also in say whole chapter regarding Kutudama and uh, well he said it is very important but actually I don't know anybody besides you to doing Kutudama in Aikido. I mean the, the people that I know of course probably should be many people in Japan but the popular the popular teacher they don't teach that. For me it's a very important part of my practice um, again, evoking the spirit, for instance, of Aikido or Aikino or Kami, chanted over and over again with emotion and with gratitude and as an expression of being alive. And it gives me something very special for me personally. Okay, so uh, obviously Aikido is not the technique. The technique is some expression of something what is inside. If the people just repeating, repeating some forms, it doesn't go to anywhere. How to develop this is what is inside and to express the proper Aikido okay. technique, which in one level the technique just don't exist. What is happened with us and say? One of the most important things for me is deep self-observation. If you think about it, for every emotion that you experience in your life, there is somehow, somewhere, a physical sensation. Think about it, for every emotion that you experience, there is a physical sensation in your body. If you're feeling angry, um, depressed, elated, even um, jealous, any, any emotion whatsoever. If you look at yourself at that moment, you will feel a corresponding physical sensation somewhere in your body. Generally, people don't distinguish themselves between the emotional self. That is to say, people will often say, I am angry, or I am depressed, making no distinction between themselves and their anger or their depression. They are saying, I am. They are identifying themselves with their emotional self, quite simply. So in that case, there is no separation between a person's <coughs> emotions and themselves. People will say, I am depressed. But quite simply, if you can learn to watch the physical sensations that accompany your depression, then you can say, there is me, and there is my depression. Or there is me and there is my anger. And a separation, a dichotomy has taken place. And quite simply by practicing this, okay, this gives a lead in to much more profound uh, practices and is, well, I have found this to be a, the answer to all the problems in my life, quite simply. And I've had a few. So, <clears throat> I'll run that past you again. For every emotion that you experience in your life, you have a physical sensation. And if you're angry, you will say, I am angry. Or, I am depressed. So by looking at your anger or your depression or your sorrow, 
then a separation, a dichotomy takes place. And if you can use this as a practice, an ongoing practice, then after a very short time, your negative emotions will quite simply disappear and you will be brought to the present moment. Most people's problems, again, are caused through projecting into the future or being attached to the past or both. And by looking at yourself totally, you're finding yourself in the present moment where your anger, your sorrow, your depression cannot exist. It is a practice, it needs to be practiced. It's no good just knowing about it as a mental concept. But if you actually practice deeply looking into your soul, deeply looking into yourself, then by watching the physical manifestation of your, your depression, your sorrow, your anger, whatever it is, by watching it, by watching the sensations in your body, you will end up separating yourself from your fear, from your sorrow, from your anger, from your depression. But it has to be an ongoing practice, something that you, that you do every day. And following on from this, by watching your own body moving, by watching your breathing. So for instance, in Zen meditation, quite simply, you're bringing yourself to the present moment by breathing in and breathing out and following your breathing from moment to moment, not in the future, not in the past, but in the present moment, from moment to moment. The only reality is now this moment. And by placing yourself in that moment, then you have the possibility of expressing your true self, your true nature, which is universal consciousness. I hope that can answer your question. Uh, yes, that, that is the process, what's happening in Zazen meditation, right? What about, can we achieve this without Zazen meditation? Even Just without like deep, observa deep self-observation? Without sitting down and practicing Zen meditation, you can be walking along the street, you can be sitting watching television. Another good practice for this, for us guys, when we, when us guys watch action films, very, very often we are mo emotionally involved and we identify with the hero of the film and we are taken over somehow. And then after the film is over, it's kind of relief, you're still alive, the good guys won. But one practice you can do is to quite simply watch and feel yourself okay, identifying emotionally with the hero. Then you can practice breaking off this emotional connection and watching it dispassionately as an exercise. You may wish to enjoy the film and be, you may wish to become totally emotionally involved in the film. But as an exercise, try to see yourself being totally involved totally emotionally involved. Or watch a film and make your mind up not to become emotionally involved. And by watching yourself become emotionally involved, you'll feel and see your breathing change. You'll watch your shoulders come up. You'll watch different things happen. You might even experience excitement and fear yourself. And this is just an illusion. It's just happening to someone else. It's somebody else's experience and not yours. And yet, we become bound up, we become taken away by this illusion of somebody else's experience. So quite simply by realizing this, this can help you also um, as an exercise to become more self-aware and to develop a self-consciousness or a continuity of self-consciousness. When you walk down the street, quite simply, you can watch one foot go ahead of the other. Normally when you walk down the street, you don't think anything. Your feet are working by themselves very, very well. They know what to do. But just by watching what they're doing as you're walking, you're bringing yourself to the present moment. And in the same way, when someone is making showman or any other attack in Aikido, by watching your own response and feeling what's happening inside your body at that moment, from moment to moment, then you're developing a continuity of consciousness. You're putting yourself in the present moment rather than the what if moment, which is usually in the future, perhaps being hurt. I don't know whether this answers your question. 
yes answer completely I hope so so this is the same thing covering the fear because um, many people have a problem with the fear so if they afraid they need to learn how to detach from from that yes. from that feeling which actually is not there because this is the same thing when I teach self-defense kids classes I just explain them because that that uh, if somebody afraid of something it doesn't mean that he's covered because once they put that label they identify themselves with that label and start to behave according to that label and uh, well for adults for adults to understand that actually you are not the label you're something that that allow the label to be there yes exactly. and you just need to detach from that because everything is created by our thoughts anyway so everything is like a virtual reality uh, it's it's interesting that uh, this year I visit the David Tyke show and this is what he was explaining that everything is consciousness it's it's your choice what frequency to choose if you if you choose the frequency of fear you will you will be in that reality and uh, if we if we go now to us and say actually if if we suppose that he was existing a frequency of, of love and compassion and all these higher spiritual virtues so obviously there is no fear there mm -hmm. so uh, how I understand this simply if we have to change we need to adapt that qualities uh, by all these spiritual virtues to practicing them and then then there will be no place for the the negative things is that right. simple way that can say that exactly please also consider that whatever you do a lot of in your life you get good at if you breathe badly you get very good at breathing badly <laughs> if you go around complaining you're actually practicing and getting good at complaining if your lifestyle produces anxiety then you're practicing and getting good at being anxious so a thing to consider through self-observation try to realize what you're actually practicing in your life that is very negative and harmful for yourself again through self-observation by watching the physical sensations of your anxiety or your sorrow or your fear by watching those those signs those feelings in your body you separate yourself and you can separate yourself from your fear, from your anxiety, etc. But it's important not to carry on the same mental and emotional patterns through your life. So try to change your emotional patterns. That is to say, you can do this by changing your behavior. If you behave as if you're a happy person, then you're actually practicing being happy. And by constant practice, you can actually influence your emotional life totally and change it but it's all to do with self-observation being conscious of yourself as a human being and being able to look at what you thought were the negative parts of yourself so most people only want to look at what they see as the good parts the good side of themselves but real deep self-observation practice is concerned with seeing yourself from the very top to the very bottom seeing what you're really capable of. It's frightening at some times. It can be very disturbing, but slowly you can come to terms with what it is to be a human being, what it is to have compassion, love, and also the opposite of those things. Then when you become totally conscious of yourself, you can make true decisions in your life. Most of the decisions that people make in their life are conditions brought about by their own conditioning conditioning brought on by society, by the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? By the conditioning of their family life. The likes and dislikes of their parents, for instance, can be transferred onto the children by just conditioning, nothing to do with reality. And so by using self-observation, by finding what you really like, what really makes you happy, then this can change your life totally but again it has to be an ongoing practice not some mental concept that you just happen to know about or have read about 
Yes, this is one of the it's a very common thing that you understand something with your brain, but still this is still in your brain. It's not your experience. Just like you have a library, but so what? You just have in, just information. And you can live with that information and believe that it's there until you not facing reality with your experience. Mm -hmm. say, is there anything else that you would say to the to your students or the people who practice Aikido? I think that Aikido is a gift to humanity. Please don't waste it with needless fighting. Don't have rivals in the dojo. If you see someone who's perhaps you think maybe a little better than you, help him. If you see someone uh, who needs help, go and help them. Try to make it your job in the dojo to help everybody. Then perhaps people will see this in you and you will become an example. And if everybody did that, the dojo will become a completely different place. Your society, your family will become different. Um, the country could be different. The world could become different. And it's only through ego and lack of self-awareness that there is such um, insanity in the world at the moment. Through self-observation, these things can be overcome. Through love, compassion, self-observation, you can overcome anything. Thank you very much, Sensei.